Alright folks, let's uh, let's get started. Welcome to uh, this distinguished lecture put on by the Transnational Law Institute, the first of the term. It's a great joy to introduce Bill Burke White to all of you. Bill is the Deputy Dean and Professor of Law at the Penn Law School. As you know, he's an expert in international law, international relations, and global governance. He served most recently in the Obama administration for two years, where he worked on Secretary Clinton's policy planning staff, providing direct advice on multilateral diplomacy and international institutions. He's a distinguished scholar and university administrator his work in the past has addressed issues of post-conflict justice, international investment and economic law, and the role of politics in both the formulation and implementation of international law. Personally, his work I have found of, the, of great interest relates to the development of the notion of positive complementarity, which those of you who are at least in my section of transnational will explore when we talk about the International Criminal Court and its interface with local justice on the ground in a diverse area of places. Bill actually has considerable on the ground experience in the DRC and other areas in Africa and elsewhere. He's a widespread presence in media and policy debates. He's an energetic speaker and a great teacher. And let's give him a warm welcome. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, uh, Mark, for that really lovely introduction uh, and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for actually being here. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many people come out for an international law talk. I wish we could uh, get the same turnout for international law events uh, at, at Penn. So uh, seriously, thanks for coming. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is a little bit risky because I'm going to try to link up my two and a half years working for Secretary Clinton with my uh, academic scholarship, the policy debates I'm engaged in, uh, and try to at once give you uh, some war stories from, uh, from the State Department uh, and a serious sort of academic talk on international law and international relations. And we'll see if I can succeed at that in about, in about 30 minutes. But first, I want you to come with me to a day in February 2009, and scary enough, that's four years ago next week, um, when I walked into the doors at C Street, the State Department, uh, and for the first time sat down with Secretary Clinton working on her policy planning staff. Uh, and one of the first questions that we were faced with was what would happen to the G8 and the G20? If you recall back then, it was in the middle of the financial crisis, and George Bush, to his credit, for the first time, had called together the G20, the group of 20 largest economies in the world, together at the head of state level, it had initially been a finance minister's organization, called them together at the head of state level to respond to the global financial crisis, first uh, in London, uh, first in Washington, then in London. Uh, and we were faced with a choice of what do we do with this G20? And what does it mean for the G8, the old league of first seven, and then when you added Russia under Clinton, uh, eight uh, large economies, but also sort of like-minded countries? Uh, and what role will these two organizations play in solving global challenges going forward? And I remember drafting one of my first memos in that job, which had the title of GX, question mark. The X being what was the right number of states? to bring together to solve the collective challenges that we were facing then and still are facing today. Um, and it's a hard question to answer because those challenges are diverse, but they all require collective action. So whether you were dealing with global economics or climate change or nuclear nonproliferation, we came to very quickly realize that eight states uh, that had been the sort of traditional G8 were no longer able, lacking, say, the presence of China and India and Brazil, to respond to those challenges. Uh, at the same time, what number was right and where do you draw that line? Um, let me jump to another kind of global challenge that, or, or structural challenge that I was asked to think about, uh, which was this reform of the United Nations Security Council. 
Uh, I don't know if any of you remember when President Obama went first to India and then subsequently to Brazil and had a line in his speech at the uh, uh, Indian Parliament and in Brazil saying, we look forward to the day when India will become a member of the UN Security Council. You don't want to know how many hours and how many pages of policy memo and inner Washington fighting it took to get that line in the speech. But the more substantive question that I was asked to think about as an international lawyer and a political scientist is what's the right number of states to have on the Security Council going forward? What are the likely behaviors of countries like Brazil or India if you put them on the Council? What happens if you put Brazil on the Council and Argentina is unhappy? What happens if India has a permanent seat and Pakistan responds to that? Thinking about the structure there became a critical set of policy choices for us, but also what happens to U.S. interests. Uh, as much as I like to think of myself as a global uh, you know, uh, international lawyer thinking about the world in terms of what the law ought to be, uh, I remember a meeting where uh, um, uh, uh, Susan Rice uh, was essentially making the argument that, look, right now the United States has the ability, without exercising its veto on the Security Council, to block any resolution simply by asking our friends to come along with us and vote no without exercising a veto. And all we have to do is get about four or five states beyond our Western European group within the Council to vote with us and we can pass a resolution. But that if we expanded the council from 15 members to, say, 21 members, uh, and you suddenly had the Indias and Brazils on the council, what would that mean for advancing U.S. interests? What would it mean for dealing uh, with the problems we have today in Syria, where Russia and China are vetoing? Would they be more willing to exercise their authority on the council uh, if India and Brazil or South Africa were there to come along with them? Or would those countries create a new dynamic that might allow you to actually uh, achieve some things at the council we couldn't? A third example, Copenhagen. Copenhagen was supposed to be President Obama's chance to really move climate change forward. Uh, yet, a week and a half into the Copenhagen meeting, President Obama was not even going to get on the plane to go because so little progress was being made. Um, President Obama decided that he cared enough that he was going to get on the plane and go to Copenhagen despite the very real risk of failure. Well, those of us sitting around the bowels of the State Department were desperately trying to figure out how do you strike a deal with 193 states in the room? How can you turn the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change process that was supposed to be inclusive of all these states into a meaningful outcome. What happened in Copenhagen was that the presidents of China, Brazil, and India sat down in a room and luckily President Obama heard about it and got to the room in time to be part of a negotiation that at least led to the, the, the outcome document that you saw, which was a pledge to try to do more on climate change, uh, but that the decision-making place was suddenly a room of five states that really didn't include the European partners who forever had been our largest and most important ally on uh, any sets of issues, but particularly those like climate change. So I start with these stories because they suggest to me a place where international law and international relations come together and where academic work on these issues really has meaningful policy impact. So with those stories out there, I'm going to shift gears, talk a little bit about theory uh, and academic research, and then come back and say how I think these things come together. So in 1993, uh, my mentor, uh, a woman named Anne Marie Slaughter, who uh, is a professor at Princeton and was the secretary's chief policy advisor when I was at the State Department, uh, wrote an article um, on uh, the linkage of international law and international relations. Another I, uh, IL scholar, Ken Abbott, wrote a similar article at about the same moment. And what they both said was that for international lawyers to remain relevant, uh, they had to both grapple with politics and borrow from political science. That for too long, international lawyers had essentially lived in a world where they were trying to prove their own uh, importance in the world against what you might call a realist critique 
where realists like Hans Morgenthau in the 1950s and 60s essentially said international law is irrelevant, it's all about power, uh, and at most uh, international law uh, is sort of an epiphenomenon of that power. It represents power distributions. Uh, but that international lawyers had responded to that by doing one of two things, either going in to uh, think about their role, and this was particularly what the Europeans did as scientists, they would do what I hope all of you are doing, in, or many of you are doing in your 1L international law classes, learning the tools of interpretation, learning how to read a treaty, learning what role the travaux preparatoires might play in interpretation. And international lawyers were very much sort of in that mindset. Uh, but what I think we saw beginning, and particularly in 1993, when Anne-Marie and Ken Abbott wrote these, these papers, was to say, we're in a new world where if international lawyers are going to be relevant, they're going to have to borrow from uh, a broader array of political science theory uh, and are going to have to really grapple with the politics of international law. And uh, for any of you who are political scientists or study political science as an undergraduate, you'll notice that between about 1980 and 2000, a number of new sort of uh, new theoretical approaches began to emerge in political science. Political science had traditionally been dominated by realist thinkers. These are these people who say power is all that matters. And you started to see three new streams of international relations scholarship emerge. One was based on what we call institutionalism, which essentially uh, is the work of folks like Joe Nye and, and Bob Cohane that says, look, it's not all about power. It's also about the institutions that allow us to mediate that power and that states can cooperate in various ways uh, where you create institutional structures that allow for, facilitate cooperation by, for example, reducing the transaction costs of state uh, engagement with one another. A second stream that followed that uh, was a stream about what was called liberalism. And liberalism here, I don't mean, you know, Obama's a liberal and, and uh, Romney isn't, but I mean uh, political science liberalism, which really says that states do what interest groups within those states demand that states do. And that it matters a great deal both what individuals and interest groups within the state want and who is represented in that state. Who, you know, in North Korea, the interest group uh, is the president, if you can call him that. Uh, in Iran, the interest group that's represented uh, may be the clerical establishment in the United States at some broad set of the American electorate, and that that nature of government representation really matters to political outcomes. The fourth theory that emerged probably mostly in the 90s and, and early 2000s is called constructivism. And it's a theory that basically says it's ideas that matter. What matters is what a state believes, what its identity is, that Switzerland's behavior will be governed more by the fact that Switzerland's identity is as a neutral state uh, and one that is you know, generally peace-loving and money-loving rather than um, uh, any particular calculation of power and interest. Or that America's actions in the world, whether it's uh, do we intervene in Libya, uh, do we intervene in Syria, will be guided by our historical memory, our memory of Vietnam, our memory of the American soldiers in Somalia, our memory of Bill Clinton having to go to Rwanda and apologize for doing nothing about the genocide. All right, that's enough political theory for a second. What does all that mean for international lawyers? What it means is that where I think the, much of the most interesting work in international law has gone over the past 20 years is applying these three, set, these four, uh, if you will, sets of political science theories to answering some of the most fundamental questions about international law and why states behave the way they do with respect to international legal rules. Um, specifically, there are, I would argue, three sets of questions that political science and international relations theory has allowed international lawyers to address in ways they never could before. Uh, if you think of the historical role of the international lawyer as that role of treaty interpretation, right? These questions are very different. The first is why states comply with legal rules. Uh, why do states behave the way they do in relation to a legal rule? And each of these theories has offered us new ways of answering that question. 
Um, and in the academic paper that sort of this talk is at least in part based on that, I'm, that I know is available to anyone who wants it here, um, I go through and I trace all of the scholarship that's applied to each of these theories. And I'm not going to bore you with that because you probably um, don't want to know every last piece of academic scholarship that's been written in the last 20 years. Um, but let me try to give you a partial answer to why this import of political science theory has mattered. And on compliance, realism, the old historic sort of approach of political science, would essentially say international law is irrelevant to compliance. States comply when it is in their interest, as defined by power, to comply. If you have the power to resist, you will if it's in your interest to do so. And international lawyers didn't like that because that meant we really had very little role in the world uh, and that most of the time states were just flaunting their power in the faces of international lawyers. In contrast, institutionalism allowed us to look at compliance differently. It said states will comply where you can reduce the costs of transaction, the costs of compliance, through the creation of institutions. And there's been huge streams of scholarship looking at how every imaginable institution, whether uh, it's the UN uh, or a regional organization or the WTO, can help reduce those costs of compliance. Then there's been a wide range of liberal theory that has essentially tried to say what matters to whether states comply is what the interest groups within those states want and who, those, who is represented by the national government. These are theories that say, for example, that democratization matters, that democratic states may well be more law-abiding because they are reflecting the interest of a wider group of citizens within their states. Uh, and this is a stream of scholarship that I've uh, written a lot about, uh, but it's one that really says we, in order to understand state behavior with respect to international legal rules, you have to understand domestic governments. And it's given international lawyers lots of new tools to think about why states do what they do that have focused on really diving into a state. It's why um, you know, I would go to Eastern Congo to study the behavior of the Congolese government because that's, in the view of a liberal, very relevant to what states uh, actually do. Finally, constructivism has helped answer these compliance questions because it focuses us on how you change identities within a state. People like Harold Coe, who was the legal advisor uh, to Secretary Clinton at the State Department, have written a lot on something called the transnational legal process. Uh, or Ryan Goodman, a law professor at NYU, uh, has written uh, about how you sort of socialize states by changing their belief structures. Uh, and that has real policy relevance. It says that programs that you do in a state that change the way people think about their identities, uh, that exposing people to new ideas, giving them different contexts in which to situate their understanding of their own roles, uh, and, you know, of their state's role in the international system, will ultimately change behavior. And across each of these four theories, lots of international lawyers have done lots of scholarship trying to test, trying to prove uh, uh, how, uh, how each of these sort of approaches actually impacts what states do. A second question that international lawyers have come to focus on with this new emphasis on political science um, is the creation of legal rules. How do legal rules come into existence? Uh, under what circumstance do they take different forms? And again, you could go through each of these theoretical approaches, realism, institutionalism, liberalism, and constructivism, and derive sets of theories uh, about why legal rules come into existence. I'm happy to do that in the Q&A. I won't bore you with it for the next five minutes. Uh, the third uh, major question that international lawyers have been able to grapple with is about the design of international institutions. Why do institutions get created? Why do they take the shape they do? Um, you know, Professor Drumble's written a lot on international criminal law and the ICC, and those are the very questions about why did the ICC take the form it took? Why did it have an independent prosecutor? Why were states willing to agree to that? Um, again, international relations theory gave international lawyers lots of new tools with which to answer that question. What's been interesting in the last few years, however, is that not just international lawyers have been asking these questions, but political scientists have as well. And to an ever greater degree, they've started to focus on international law uh, and its relevance uh, as actually impacting state behavior 
from the political science perspective. Um, it's my argument in, in the paper I wrote and in part to you today that the interdisciplinary collaboration, the borrowing by international law scholars of international relations theory, and the uh, focus on international law by political scientists has had an extraordinary and positive impact on uh, international law. It has made international law much more relevant. It has made us more theoretically and methodologically rigorous. It's allowed us to expand our sort of scope of questions, not just to ask what the law is, but why the law works, and to provide some testable hypotheses about what sorts of law work better, what sorts of institutional design works better, uh, and that this has been, I think, a profound sea change that I think for any of you who might want to be international lawyers makes your potential careers far more interesting and far more exciting. But I also want to suggest that interdisciplinary collaboration, and here I will be bold enough to say I don't think this is true just in international law and international relations. Uh, if there's a legal historian in the room, forgive me, but I think it's probably also true when lawyers borrow from historical methodology or from uh, law and economics, that there's real dangers here. And that I think that international law and international relations, as they've worked together, have fallen victim to some very dangerous, um, uh, well, have fallen victim to some real dangers. The first, I would argue, uh, is that methodological and substantive divides have really come to separate the field of international law that those who work on WTO law are unlikely to talk to those who work on human rights law because they're so focused and so deep into their fields, into their silos, that building bridges across becomes very difficult. We can talk to each other because we both like international criminal law, um, but I'm hard pressed to talk much to a friend who works on international business law. Um, but. Uh, the other siloing that's occurred is a methodological siloing. If you go back to international law 50 years ago, the field was dominated by some great figures who we all look up to, whether it's Lewis Henkin or Abe Shays or whoever they may have been. They were generalists. They were able to do a little bit of human rights law, a little bit of trade law, a little bit of uh, um, international institutional law in part because there was a lot less law in each of those fields at that moment than there is today. Today, if you want to be an international lawyer, you're probably actually asking yourself, do you want to be a human rights lawyer or an international trade lawyer? An investment lawyer or an environmental lawyer? Um, but uh, as, the, as, as the silos have developed, they've also developed methodologically. They've developed in the sense that those who subscribe to realism as their framework for analyzing the role of law only talk to other realists. Um, and those who subscribe to liberalism tend to do so with an often too myopic focus on domestic governments uh, and the nature of domestic civil society relations as really the only explanatory factor. Um, so I think these divides are very dangerous. I think there's also been a great deal of sloppy work by international lawyers, none in this room, I promise, uh, where international lawyers quickly borrow theories from political science or borrow methodologies that they may not be fully ready or skilled in using. Similarly, I think international relations scholars have been dangerous in their sort of focus on international law without really understanding the context, the nuance, the shifting nature of international law, the fact that international law is often more about the argument than the rule. And I think that makes international relations scholarship on international law often very weak. In fact, our friends across campus working on political science need to borrow the expertise of those in this room who understand how the law actually works if we want to analyze it with those political science tools. All right, enough on theory. I feel like I've done my sort of educational job on that. Let me swing back to my first three examples and tell you why I think all this matters. If you're asked by Secretary Clinton to write a memo that says, what's the right number of states to have in the room to solve global challenges. 
The scholarship of the last 20 years in international law and international relations is extraordinarily helpful. Why? Well, a lot's been written about institutional design. We know a lot more now about how to build an institution, how to structure it, how to design its legal rules. Not that the G20 has legal rules, but if it did, how to design them in a way that maximizes cooperation, that minimizes block politics voting, that maximizes the ability of decisions taken at the international level to be implemented domestically. It told us a number of things about, you know, it's actually beneficial to have some smaller countries in the room because they're able to often play a role in mediating between large powers. Frankly, if I really wanted to get business done in the world today, you know what GX, what that X number should be? Two, right? That's the best number. Simple. You get the U.S. and China in the room, you get them to agree, and you're probably good. But you know what? If you're actually going to get the G2 to agree on something, you may need the other 18 countries in the room. Right? So it was by borrowing from political science that international lawyers were able to see some of those features of how to design that institution. What about Copenhagen? Well, one of the things I think international relations, international law scholarship tells us um, and this is sad for me to say as an international lawyer, is that I fear that the days of large multilateral conventions may be over. That you may not be able to get 193 states today to agree on anything other than that they disagree. Uh, and that it wasn't surprising that it was that small side room with five countries in it where that bargain got struck. And that if you actually want to try to design a United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the goal of inclusivity, which is the rule of sovereign equality that you were all hopefully taught the first day of your international law class, may no longer be the right guiding principle because you simply can't get business done. The same thing may be true on our UN example. But the UN example where, where you, know, you can't put 25 countries in the room. Um, you need to get Brazil and India and maybe Japan in the room, but if you get to 25 countries, again, reaching the deal may be impossible. But perhaps the thing that is most striking when you look at the UN, uh, the question of UN Security Council reform from the perspective of sort of international law and international relations scholarship is again a sad conclusion to some degree, which is that you absolutely need reform if the UN is going to remain legitimate. That if you want countries to follow rules, one of the reasons they do it is because they believe those rules are legitimate. That comes straight from constructivist theory, it comes from institutionalist theory, it comes from liberal theory. But that the rules and structures of international law that will require, you know, the votes of the permanent five members of the Security Council and the domestic ratification of amendments make that essentially impossible. And that U.S. interests, as much as I don't want to say this, probably don't coincide, at least in the near term, with the reforms that are necessary at the U.N. At which point, what do you do? You have the President go to Brazil and say, we look forward to the day that Brazil will be a member of the Council, but you do absolutely nothing about it. Um, that's sad. That's a sad conclusion to reach. So what do I think all of this means? I think it means that those of us who are working in international law and international relations need what I have called a very different second term agenda. If you, not second term of the Obama administration, but second term of international law and international relations collaboration. That to some degree we've been focused in some of the wrong places to answer the questions that when we get called into government to try to move policy forward, we don't have answers to. So let me give you a couple of um, suggestions in that regard. First, I would argue that international law and international relations have been asking the same questions in parallel processes but without really engaging with one another that both international lawyers and international relations scholars ask why states comply with the law. But international lawyers and international relations scholars very rarely do that together. 
And that if we're really going to understand how the law works and why it works and how to make it work better, we need both sets of methodological toolkits. Um, and it has become ever harder for anyone to be an expert in both of these fields at the same time. So we really need to move to a world of, colla of collaboration rather than just parallel process. Second, I think we absolutely have to embrace all of the methodological and theoretical approaches collectively. The best answers to questions like how do we solve climate change or how do we stop the global economic crisis are ones that recognize, as realists do, that power matters. But also who say, yes, there are times when institutions can help solve power conflict. And you know what? Ideas may matter too. Too much of our approach to these questions has been based in one, method, one theoretical model. And it's collective theories that really probably give us the best answer. I also think that part of the answers may lie in changing our framework of how, what matters, what countries we look at. When I teach international law, I admit I teach more about you know, what European states did in you know, 1795 in Greenland somewhere than I do about uh, modern Africa today. But we live today in a world where there are 193 and maybe four by the time I'm done talking states. <laughs> um, and that to an ever greater degree, those states are all playing a role in the international legal system. And that means that we really have to understand what role is Togo or Fiji uh, or Vietnam or Myanmar. I can go on down the list of countries that 10 years ago were utterly irrelevant to international law and today are absolutely essential. And I think as international lawyers, we have far too much focus on the big countries uh, and the countries with which we share the most cultural or, or legal affinity. What that means is that when it comes time for me to say what are the right countries to have in the G20, I don't know because I honestly don't know what's the history of legal practice of Argentina in the international legal system uh, or of Saudi Arabia, a country that essentially wasn't even part of the international legal system in a meaningful way until a few years ago. Um, so I think we need to much broaden the scope of countries we look at and the scope of countries in which we have an expertise. And, you know, there weren't that many people who had an expertise in Morocco when suddenly there were, rev at the State Department, when there were suddenly revolutions starting. Uh, and so, again, I think we have to broaden this scope. I also think that if we want to understand how to make institutions work, if you want to figure out how do you make the G20 or the Security Council work, we need to broaden the scope of institutions we as international lawyers study. I can't tell you how many student papers or law review articles I have read on the UN Security Council. I've read a lot fewer on the African Court of Human Rights uh, and far fewer on uh, you know, regional organizations in Latin America that aren't the Inter-American Court. Um, but these institutions may have a lot to tell us and that our scholarship in terms of where our case studies are focused may actually again have to broaden. However, I think the biggest point that I want to make about how international lawyers need to change the way we think uh, if we're going to solve the kinds of real life challenges that, that you get asked to do in the State Department um, is to bring power back into the equation. International lawyers, almost by definition, don't like power. We're afraid of power. We're afraid of it because, you know what, it's the powerful states that ignore international law. It's the tanks that you often see uh, that sort of roll past the international lawyers where we're sitting there saying, no, that war might be illegal. Um, we're very comfortable telling you what the legal rule is that prohibits the use of power. And to a large degree, we've therefore excluded from the frame in which we've studied international law questions of power. Power is shifting around us faster than we can grapple with today. Um, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, maybe Egypt again. I can come up with a list of countries that five or ten years ago were not that important to international legal rulemaking. These countries today have the power not just to influence at the margins, 
But to fundamentally determine whether a new rule gets created to, uh, to see, succeed Kyoto. They fundamentally have the power to determine whether the Security Council gets reformed. It's actually China more than the U.S. that's blocking Security Council reform. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, international relations scholars were focused on these questions of power. Uh, but international lawyers sought to avoid them. And I think we have to return to them. I think we have to return to them because we have to understand how international law works in a world in which the United States is not the sole superpower, in a world in which um, Europe is barely at the table. Sorry, my European friends, I'm flying to Europe tonight, but guess where I'm going? I'm going to Russia. Why? Because frankly, today what Moscow wants to do on Syria matters a lot more than what Berlin wants to do on Syria. Um, my point is simply that if we're going to be effective as international lawyers, not just effective at telling one another what the rules are or what we wish the rules were, but at actually designing institutions, creating new legal rules, and enforcing the existing ones, we have to understand this new power dynamic. And it's one that I think often we will not like because it means we don't really like the nature of that room uh, in Copenhagen where the climate change deal got struck. Um, but it's a room that we're going to have to get ever more comfortable dealing with. And I think international lawyers have a lot to add to that conversation. Because if we can figure out the kind of legal rules those countries will accept, the way they think about and understand international lawmaking and the purposes of international law, if we can understand the new kinds of institutions, the design structures that aren't those of 1945 anymore, we'll be able to do a lot of good in both advancing U.S. interests and I think in promoting a lot of the values that most international lawyers tend to subscribe to. Um, but we can't do that if we remain in a mindset that has really dominated international law and even international law and international relations scholarship for the last 20 years. So I've gone on slightly over my 30 minutes. Um, I want to stop there, but put the floor open to questions. And let me be uh, completely frank here. I'll talk about anything. If you want to talk about war stories from Secretary Clinton's State Department, she's, as of this morning, I think, no longer Secretary of State, so I can uh, tell you all the war stories. Um, or uh, if you want a more academic conversation, um, uh, I'll go anywhere. So the floor is open, and shall I just call on people? Go for it. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Logan. Um, you were talking about the power shifting. Yeah. And my biggest concern is in my reading, um, back in 1987, they said that the G8 met. Yeah. And it, excuse me, they learned nervous. Um, <laughs> no worries. Um, I walked over here saying I have to feel as nervous. You can talk to me rather than all that. All right. Um, they met and they agreed to devalue the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm reading this, it sounds to me that like the U.S. was willing to sacrifice their interests for, I guess, global reasons or you know for the better interests of the global. Mm -hmm. You know. And so now we're in a situation where um, we have this debt and we owe it. Own, um, China owes most, but own most of our debt. And so with this power shifting. Are we going to get that same, I guess, type of forgiveness, you know, when it comes to, okay, now they're, you know, regulating most of the, they have that power to say yes or no? Right, so, you know, starting in about 1945, maybe even a little earlier, you know, the U.S. dollar was the global, became the global reserve currency, and we could essentially set both global interest rates and print as much money as we wanted, which was great. The good news is we still can, largely because, you're right, China has bought a lot of our debt. Um, and guess who owns a lot of our debt? China. And guess the one thing they don't have an interest in? Devaluing the U.S. dollar, because guess what? They have a lot of them sitting over there. What it does mean, however, is that the United States and China today are in a deeply interdependent relationship. We can't tell China what to do, and China can't tell us what to do. If China wants to threaten us that they're going to sell all their U.S. dollar holdings and break the dollar, guess who that's really going to break? China, right? So we like that interdependence. I think we're a little more dependent than we would want to be. It would be nice if they didn't own quite so much of our debt. Um, and you know, there's real fiscal challenges in the United States. But I'm a lot less worried uh, about China putting a run on the U.S. dollar. Um, but I will say, um, you know, that the euro 
for a little while was a sort of could be a threat to the U.S. reserve currency, thankfully. Well, I don't know if it's thankfully. The Europeans can't figure out what they're doing and where they are and where they're going, so I'm not as worried about that. Um, but, you know, the Chinese, remember me, the yuan, is it going to become a very powerful currency? China right now is desperately trying to control the value of their currency, largely because that makes exports uh, cheaper, uh, and therefore we buy more stuff from China, and that keeps jobs going in China. China may seem like it's a rising power, and it is, it's really powerful, and that's a big piece of what I've been saying today. At the same time, they're extremely vulnerable. They need to maintain growth rates somewhere between 6 and 8% uh, in order to keep employing all the young people that are coming into the workforce in China. They can't do that very easily right now. And so if the Chinese currency becomes too strong, uh, there's going to be a domestic economic crisis in China of the first order. And I was over in China in November. I'll be back there in a couple weeks. Uh, and when there was the power transition um, in, in November in China, there was huge uncertainty, partly because they don't have a, a sufficiently robust political system. And I think one of the lessons we've learned is that to have kind of the global reserve currency and have a strong and economic basis, we do, you have to have a political system that's equally strong. So China's got a lot of problems as well. Um, I'm less worried that they're going to try, however, to have sort of a run on the U.S. dollar. But what we will need to see is a greater shift in international institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank, where China's going to have an ever bigger seat. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with them in those contexts. Uh, and I think that's going to be tricky. Others? Yes? Oh, my name is Nicole Buchan. I'm a Raphael. And I was wondering, uh, what role do you see for international law in addressing the uh, Iranian nuclear threat? And in particular, do you think that the economic sanctions are sufficient and whether uh, resort to actual use of forces can be avoided? So this is a, it's a really tough question. Um, it's tough because it forces me to, uh, at some point, recognize that international law can't solve all problems. But international, international law is not ultimately, in and of itself, going to stop the Iranians from developing a nuclear weapon. Um, you know, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty says what it says, and Iran doesn't seem to care. But what international law can do, and has done very effectively, uh, is a huge number of things, right? It has helped us create sanctions regimes that, for the first time, are having real bite on Iran. And we spent a lot of time flying around the world, talking to the Turks, talking to the Emiratis, to, and by using international law, both Security Council resolutions and the argument that says, look, you know, um, uh, Turkish government, here's the rule, and they're breaching it, right? That lets you frame the diplomatic argument. And we've been really successful, we as in when I was in government, but my, one of my best friends is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iran Sanctions, and he goes around the world reminding governments of those very legal commitments, right? So that's one piece that's been very effective. The other piece that's also been really effective are the international legal rules about stopping transfer of materials, right? Um, and that, that's partly Bush's proliferation security initiative, uh, but it's also the ability to go and, you know, intercept uh, a, a shipment when it's in transit. So international law matters there, too. And international law will frame the debate and discussion uh, if there's ever an ultimate resolution, right? It's going to be partly an international legal process. Again, there's a limit. Um, at the same time, there's real challenges to international law and what's happening in Iran. Uh, I'm not going to confirm or deny that the United States might or might not have been involved in something called Stuxnet, which was an attack on Iran's um, nuclear um, refinement capacity. But that's a big challenge to international legal rules. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, note the different word I used, I don't know whether Israel attacked Syria uh, last night. Um, but again, there's a real question of can you, um, you know, enter into another state's territory to stop the transfer of what might have been uh, nuclear or other materials. So international has a lot to say about it. Um, but again, you know, power is also going to matter. And it's why I think as good international lawyers we need to be very fluent in dealing with, with both things. Uh, ultimately, I think the sanctions are working. I'm a little nervous that the Iranians this morning announced they were going to upgrade the refinement capability at Natanz. Um, I'll tell you a fun story, though. I was in Iran. I've been in Iran four times. 
And I was there in 2006, 2005, I guess. And I got in a taxi uh, in Esfahan. And I knew three words of Farsi, and my taxi driver knew two words of English, so we had a really interesting conversation. And so he takes out his cell phone, which was still sort of an old-fashioned version then, but it could still show a video. And he started, he pressed play on the video. And the video showed an airplane flying at the Twin Towers. It was clearly a sort of rendering of September 11th. And the airplane flies toward the Twin Towers, and I'm sitting there with my stomach churning, and I'm, you know, I'm in a taxi with this guy who's about to show me you know, videos of 9-11. And as the plane gets up to the towers, the towers bend apart, the plane flies through the center, and the Star Spangled Banner starts to play. And the taxi driver just says, I love America, my family's in LA. <laughs> in the film industry. <laughs> yeah. But my, the point of that story is both it was one of the sort of warmest moments of, of my life, but um, it also says that we have to be careful that when we have one objective, we don't pursue it in a way that undermines another objective. And there's a real, you know, we have to stop Iran from, you know, developing a nuclear bomb, but we have to do so in a way that he doesn't, in fact, start playing to me a video of September 11th. And... Um, figuring out how to balance that is hard, but one of the things that really does matter, if you go to Brazil, right, the Brazil, or to South Africa, I went down to South Africa for a, a conversation on uh, Syria and, and Libya last year, is legitimacy matters. And framing your argument as legitimate or right under international law matters in a way that in American public debate it doesn't. Right? The South Africans were deeply angry because they believed that when we invaded Libya, we exceeded the mandate of Resolution 1973, the one that said we could you know, uh, use force against, against Libya. And their view was that in, ex you know, in exceeding that mandate, you undermine the legitimacy of the responsibility to protect. Uh, and so my point is, I think, you know, if, to the degree we can deal with Iran within legal structures, frame arguments as legitimate, we may eventually be more effective. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Blake Huber. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, you've talked a lot about the shifting power dynamics, especially recently. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you thought on whether or not that could actually sort of enhance the legitimacy of international law, as opposed to, say, you know, post-World War II era, there were two major superpowers, the U.S. and uh, the Soviet Union, and they could basically do whatever they wanted because, you know, nobody could really contest them, and they were pretty solid in terms of the power they wielded for some time. But nowadays with everything with everything going on with you know power shifting all the time, I wonder if that would create a greater incentive to uh, obey international law. Just because you can do what you want now doesn't mean you would be able to do that in necessarily even five or three years from now. Yeah, I think that the sort of rise of new powers and the expansion of the number of states that matter has uh, really important, you know, legitimating effects, right? If you go to Brazil, they think the G20 is a lot more legitimate than the G8. You know why? Because they're in it, right? Um, and if you go to Togo, they think the General Assembly is pretty legitimate, because at least they've got a seat if they can afford to get to the, you know, get to New York. Um, there's a danger, though, about the effectiveness, right? The, the, and it's always a tension between legitimacy and effectiveness. The more people you put in the room, the more legitimate its process is, but perhaps the less effective it is. When we've thought about the Security Council, there's a number somewhere between 17 and 22 where we believe the tipping point is on effectiveness, that if you get over about 21 states in the room, we don't think you can ever reach uh, an agreement. The other aspect of your question, though, was, you know, can you now redesign institutions that look more legitimate to today's global power realities? Uh, you know, I don't think anyone today would agree that the Europeans should have two seats at the UN Security Council, much less the third seat that Germany wants. Uh, and yeah, if you redesign the permanent members of the Security Council today, there'd be one European seat, there'd be a US seat, there'd be an Indian seat, a Chinese seat, maybe a Brazilian seat, you know, and then we can start having some debate. But if you did that 10 years ago, it would have been Japan and Germany at the table and not Brazil. One of the things that means is we have to have much better ways to have flexibility in our institutional design. You know, we want to lock in structures that are lasting, but if you, you know, the UN Security Council is so hardwired that change is almost impossible. Um, I also think that the United States is coming to realize, slowly, 
that um, we want to build structures that are lasting because we know that right now we can influence those structures in a way that we can't 20 or 50 years from now. You know what two countries want Security Council reform right now more than anybody else? France and England and the UK. Why? Because they know if they reform it now, they get to keep their seats. If they wait 10 years, they have to go down to their one European seat, probably. So that does change a lot of incentives. And I hope that the U.S. starts to look at the world with that longer time horizon. I will say this. It's really hard when you're in government to look at the world with a 10 or 20 year time horizon. You're looking at it with a two, four, and at most eight year time horizon. Um, and for most sort of questions of institutional design, that's simply not long enough. Uh, yes, ma'am. scholar who says, oh, uh, isn't that nice? We can simply code compliance with this treaty without realizing that compliance is, is not a binary you know, choice. So what I'm saying from the academic standpoint is that if you're going to do that interdisciplinary work, you need to either do it jointly with someone who has the other set of skills uh, or really invest the time to build the kind of knowledge and skills it takes to do good interdisciplinary work. The most important sort of outcomes, I think, in international law scholarship will be interdisciplinary, but they've got to be done well. All right, now what's the practical question? Um, let me answer the question in part this way. So one of the fun things I got to do when I was in the State Department was I got lots of resumes from people who wanted political appointments to work uh, you know, for Secretary Clinton. And uh, every single person we hired was a lawyer. Not surprising, because the secretary was a lawyer, and the president was a lawyer, and everybody else in the senior staff was a lawyer. Very few of them were just lawyers. Um, why? Because being a lawyer meant that we knew that that person would be smart, would be flexible, could work hard, could think analytically and rigorously. But then I also needed somebody who was an expert in Egyptian constitutional reform. So one of the people we hired was a lawyer who also had an advanced degree in you know, Middle East history or Middle East politics or something like that. Um, and I think you're right. I think if you really want a successful career in international law today, it doesn't mean you have to go get a PhD in something, but it means you need to bring more than just your legal degree to bear on the question. And there's lots of ways you could do that. You could do a master's in political science and maybe have some of the toolkits to do uh, empirical analysis, right? And that would be one kind of approach to it. Um, you could become a regional expert uh, and know a lot about Russia or China and then meld those two things together. You could get a master's in public administration degree and really understand the policy dynamics of legal questions. Uh, or you could just build up your own expertise in an area of international law to the point where you were really the expert on it. Um, you know, if you want to work on international criminal law, really become an expert in it. And I think successful careers, particularly in government today, in the international law space, will be a mix of expertise and generalist ability. I need to be able, if I'm you know, working in the State Department, to pull the person who was doing you know, Russia policy over and make them a Middle East expert at short notice when the Arab Spring happens, but I also need somebody who actually understands the Middle East. So 
If I was thinking about career paths, I would say, where is it that I get that extra something? Maybe it's a gra another graduate degree. Maybe it's a certain set of experiences. Maybe it's some time overseas in a country or a region. Uh, but I think it's about bringing both of those to the, together that gets the strongest resume, that gets the most interesting and best job. But obviously, that's a process across a whole career. I started life as a Russianist. Uh, then Russia sort of got uninteresting in the mid-90s when it was sort of broke and you know, forgotten. <laughs> and I said, I need a different skill set. I became an international lawyer. Then I went and got a PhD in political science. But I still have that little bit of Russia. And that's a kind of, I like that fact. I mean, it's the country I actually know and speak the language. So I do think that you know, the, the country expertise is always a, a good one. I think we can do one or two more. Uh, in the blue shirt in the back there. Yeah, I think that was the one in there. I just wanted to ask, um, in an age of increased international cooperation, ultimate goal of preventing conflict, does the concept of a geopolitical foe still exist? And if so, was Secretary Clinton more concerned with promoting U.S. interests abroad at the expense of other nations, or was she more concerned with integrating the U.S. into cooperative global community? Um, so do foes exist? Absolutely foes exist, you know? Uh, I think it is fair to say that the Iranian government today is a foe of the United States. Uh, I don't think it's wise to say that China is our number one strategic enemy, however. Um, and I think the answer to your second question is to say that the answer is both at once. Right? The question is, how do we promote U.S. interests by building an international institutional system that protects U.S. interests, that advances those interests, um, but that brings other countries into it because you need them to be part of it, which is why you do things like, um, uh, you know, establish the G20. Uh, engage with ASEAN in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, commit to a Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership because you need that institutional structure uh, to advance U.S. interests. So you want to do both at once. Uh, so I have one hand just in front here. Yeah. From an international philosophy, what exactly can we do when a powerful player does something that's in some ways illegal? If Russia shuts off natural gas to Belarus in the middle of February, mm -hmm. the Chinese Defense Ministry hacks the New York Times, is there anything we can actually do? Yeah. And actually, this is where international relations theory may tell us the most. So if you're a realist, what do you do in that circumstance? You show or use power, right? And that was the traditionally the only answer there was. Somebody invades you or whatever, and, and that's the response. Um, but uh, other theories give you very different answers, right? What should we be doing? Uh, well, here's a different example. Russia, I'll flip it, because it'll be Russia today made an announcement saying that if Israel if Israel attacked Syria yesterday, that that was a blatant breach of the UN Charter, right? And you can get out there and make a very powerful statement. Uh, and that actually has impact. You can rally NGOs or civil society around issues where they have traction and salience. Uh, you can create, you can think more long term about how do we design institutions that prevent that from happening. One answer to China might be maybe we need a lot more internet, co internet freedom cooperation and institutional engagement with China to shift their beliefs and values in this area. And that would be a kind of more constructivist response. Um, or you go back to the power side and the United States through the UN Security Council will try to impose sanctions on a country. I don't think that will happen in the China case. Um, but it's, it's about trying to think very creatively about different responses that may not be formally mandated in the law, but can be brought to bear because of the legal breach. Uh, and again, I think that's a place where international lawyers have a lot of creative thinking to do. Sanctions are often an answer that's suggested. They're a very blunt policy instrument. We need to figure out how do you make them so you can turn them on and off more quickly so they don't have chilling effects outside of your target. So those are all places that we do need to do more work. Um, and there will be times where there's not a viable response from international law. Um, I am being told that it's noon, which means I need to let you go. Um, but thank you so much for being here today. This has been a great time. Okay. Two quick things. As Bill pointed out, uh, he needs to hit the road. And you've already thanked him for coming. He basically traveled through tonight to be with us here today before he heads off again. So that's really fantastic and all that energy. Uh, our next presenter will come in February and I have one small announcement. Uh, Professor Jim Armstead is here with us today and he's interested in speaking with any students here who would have an interest in working with him on an ABA human rights project. 
on the theme of getting more involved in terms of specific areas of expertise. So Jim's right there, and if you'd like to chat with him, feel free to do so. Let's thank Bill once again for a fantastic